Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord of hosts. Bless, O Lord, the reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. John. Glory to you, O Lord. O Lord. Our Lord, God and Savior and King of us all, Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, to be the glory forever. Amen. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because the God the Father has set his seal on him. And they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, What sign will you perform then? that we may see it and believe you. What work will you do? Our fathers ate the man in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and he who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured against him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Spirit one God Amen. This is the third Sunday of the month of Amshir. And all the Sundays, all the readings, Sunday readings of this month center around Christ as the bread of life and centering around the Eucharist. So I wanted to speak and actually today in the gospel, our Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the bread of life. So I wanted to speak a little bit about the Eucharist. I'm going to talk about why is the Eucharist important for my salvation. If you think, going all the way back to Adam and Eve, before they fell, they're living in love, they're living in peace, they're living in purity. When they ate from the tree, they realized they were naked and they covered themselves. Then God asked them if they ate from the tree. Adam said that Eve tricked him and he ate. Eve said the serpent tricked her and she ate and there was already from the beginning disunity while before there was unity unity between Adam and Eve and unity between 
mankind and God. Later, Adam's son Cain, he kills Abel. And actually because of this, Cain is scared that other people would kill him. And it shows like in the second generation of humanity, there's already a very deep state of corruption. Sin leads to corruption. It wasn't just a matter of forgiving the sin of Adam. There's also a matter of healing from corruption. When our Lord Jesus Christ was incarnate and became man, he was fully human and fully God at the same time, and his humanity and his divinity were united together. Since divinity, his divinity is the source of life, his flesh became the source of life when they were united in the one person of the Son of God. So when we take communion, when we partake of the body and blood of Christ, we eat the source of life. We might have in our hearts this poison, this corruption inside of us that can lead to death. But God gave us in the Eucharist the antidote. He gave us life to eat. When we eat it, we regain life. That's what God explains in, in actually a little bit later on in this same chapter, John chapter 6. He says, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. This is the correct understanding of the Eucharist that the church received from Christ from the beginning. Actually, the importance of the Eucharist is demonstrated from the very beginning of church history and is explained by the church fathers. St. Justin Martyr, he says, this food is called among us Eucharist, of which no one is allowed to partake but the man who believes that the things which we teach are true and who has been washed with the washing that is for the remission of sins and unto regeneration and who is so living as Christ has instructed. So even from the first centuries, we can see St. Justin is speaking about that the Eucharist is reserved for those who are baptized, those who believe the same doctrine that is believed by the church, and those who are living in the way that Christ instructed. And then he continues, he says, For not as common bread and common drink do we receive these, but in like manner as Jesus Christ our Savior, having been made flesh by the word of God, had both flesh and blood for our salvation, so likewise we have been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word, which is the liturgy, and from which our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished, so by eating, is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. So we partake from the exact body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ had on earth. I know most of us believe this, being living our lives in the church our entire life, being born and taught this maybe from as a child in Sunday school. But I want to talk for a few minutes about if I do believe this, if I sincerely believe this, that the Eucharist is the source of life, and that it is really his body and blood, how is it that I ought to prepare for communion? How is it that I ought to prepare for communion, having this belief? Most of us, we limit our preparation for receiving the mysteries of Holy Communion to fasting. All of us have been, who were born into the church, we know from a young age, if I'm going to take communion, I can't eat or drink anything from midnight until I come take communion. But by only fasting, we are deceived into thinking that if I fasted, you know, perfectly and completely and mechanically, I followed the proper preparation, and then now I am taking communion in a worthy manner. So I want to talk about what is preparation for communion. The first thing I would say that we need to prepare ourselves correctly for communion is faith and desire for Holy Communion. Faith in the sacrament of Holy Communion. Faith that in the, the chalice, in the body and blood of Christ, himself is present physically. And specifically that the Holy Communion is not is, is, is a necessary nourishment for my salvation. And because of that, I have a longing to be united again with our Lord Jesus Christ every Sunday. 
The first Christians in the book of Acts, it says they were every day keeping watch all together in the temple. So this watching, this vigil, this burning, this longing to be united with Christ has to exist in my heart. If you think about the people who are close to you, like our close friends or our family, or maybe people who haven't seen in a while, what, how do I feel when I make plans for them and I have it with them and I haven't seen them in a few weeks or a few days, maybe a few months or maybe even longer? I'm excited. I can't wait. I keep checking my calendar. I'm eager to see them. We should long to meet our Lord Jesus Christ. In Holy Communion, not only do we meet, but we become one with Christ, from one body and one blood with, uh, with Christ. So this longing for frequent Holy Communion is important, and it grows when we understand what Holy Communion here is. It's a betrothal on earth. It is a betrothal for our complete union with God in heaven, in eternity. When our Lord Jesus Christ talked about heaven many, many times, he used the analogy of the wedding feast. And Holy Communion is like our betrothal in the, uh, for the great wedding feast in the second coming. The second thing that we ought to have if we are to prepare ourselves correctly for Holy Communion is self-examination and testing. In order for us to take communion, we should examine ourselves. Actually, this is specifically commanded by St. Paul. He says, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So an investigation of ourselves, a quiet time of prayer and contemplation and examination. This is vital to show me whether I am worthy to approach Holy Communion. But be careful, in this self-examination, I can't be either super sensitive or senseless. No one is worthy of communion. And Holy Communion is actually is not a reward for saints, but it is a medicine for sinners, people who are struggling with holiness. The self-examination of a spiritual person should never have the result of finding themselves innocent. We are always guilty in front of God. But one declaration of guilt might differ from another. So if I find myself in my self-examination guilty of grave sins, sins of the flesh, explosions of anger, a serious dispute with another person, then that person should consider not to take communion without confession. Holy Communion is received for the remission of sins. Actually, as believers, we don't take the Eucharist because we are worthy. Actually, we take it because we are unworthy and we are in need. We take courage in the mercy of God and the grace of God who calls all of us to receive the remission of sins. But at the same time, we cannot be lax with our own self-examination. So I have to have this balance to examine myself, to repent of my sins, to confess and to reconcile if necessary before I take communion. Communion is not something to be taken lightly. But I want to make sure I, I, I emphasize this has to be balanced. I examine myself. Never will I find myself worthy of communion. None of us are worthy of communion. When I, when I, am t when I prevent myself from taking communion, almost always this should be with the guidance of my spiritual father. So be careful not to take those decisions for myself. But it is important for me to regularly examine myself when I am taking communion. If the self-examination reveals uh, that I am guilty of sins preventing me from Holy Communion, then the next thing or the, uh, another way for us to prepare commun for communion is to practice the sacrament of repentance and confession. When most of us, when we sit uh, down to dinner after a long day, we feel the need first, of course, to wash our hands. It's a normal thing. If I'm going to have dinner, I wash my hands. How much more, of course, I should feel the need to wash my soul in the, in the bath of confession in order to participate for the spiritual and heavenly food. Unfortunately, some of us, we approach communion and we are not practicing regular self-examination, regular repentance, regular confession. Actually, for me as a priest, that scares me. In the vows uh, and the, of the teachings of the priest, we are instructed not to take lightly the fact that I'm distributing the body and blood of God himself. 
Actually, there is a command for the priest to examine everyone who is approaching, to make sure they are approaching in a worthy manner. The only way I know how to do this is by teaching and warning. That's why I will give a sermon like this. That's why actually in every liturgy I mention that you shouldn't take communion if you didn't attend the liturgy, if you're not baptized, if you don't speak to your spiritual father. There's a command for me, a vow for me to warn, to teach you all so that we can all take communion in a worthy manner. St. Basil, he says, don't forget the master's commandment and that of the holy apostles. For he says, do not give the holy things to the dogs. Do not cast the pearl before the swine. See that you do not hand over the Son of God into the hands of unworthy ones. Do not be afraid to stand up to the glorious of the earth, not even him who wears the royal crown at that time, to whom the divine canons do not allow, do not impart. St. Basil is giving instructions to the priests. Don't give communion to anyone who is not worthy of it, even if it's somebody who has earthly status. It doesn't matter, even if it was the king himself. So we ought to have regular self-examination, regular confession in order to prepare ourselves for communion. The fourth thing, Holy Communion, is a work of love. Out of love, God, in His incarnation, communed with His creation. He came and dwelt among men. Out of great love, He Himself offered Himself as a sacrifice for us. Out of great love, He poured out His precious blood for us. Out of his love, he offered his body and blood to be consumed by us, the faithful, in the mystery of Holy Communion. St. Paul says in Ephesians, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive with Christ. So through Holy Communion, we're made alive. Out of great love, he communed with us, became one with us. And we should, out of love, become one with him to commune his body and blood. Our approach to Holy Communion depends on the love we have for Christ. Whoever strongly loves Christ will frequently unite with Him in Holy Communion. Love for Christ urges us to take Holy Communion frequently. If the love grows cold, the longing for Holy Communion also will grow cold. It will diminish. And receiving Holy Communion becomes something mechanical and can be unto our judgment or unto our condemnation. But besides love for God, love for people. Love for people is absolutely necessary since this is the proof of one's love for God. The disciple in the, in the scripture who talks about love the most, St. John the Evangelist, in his first epistle combines the three loves. God's love for us, our love for God, and our love for others. He says, we love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him. That he who loves God must love his brother also. Christ in his Sermon on the Mount, he stresses that reconciliation, uh, making up with people that uh, we have wronged or have wronged us, has to precede our worship, our offering in the temple. He says, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. My favorite part of that verse that he mentions, our Lord Jesus Christ says, and there remember that your brother has something against you. So actually, the brother is, the, the other person is the one who maybe doesn't feel good or isn't right. He says, I should go and be the first to reconcile. That's the reason why when we begin the Liturgy of the Believers, the first part that we pray, right after we all recite the creed, we pray the prayer of reconciliation and we do the kiss of peace. Before the priest offers the sacrifice, we ask for forgiveness from the altar. And we actually we ask even the priests, they ask forgiveness from all the servants that are serving in the altar and from all of the people. And we ask forgiveness from one another in the kiss of peace. The John Chrysostom, he says, do you want to take Holy Communion? Don't feel hate and antipathy for anyone. Have love for everyone. Ultimately, there are Christians who even when they are about to commune, do not seek forgiveness of others. This is how they think. Why should I ask for forgiveness? And what if the other one took this as my weakness and wanted to misuse me? Then I would not be at fault. He would be at fault and he ought to ask me for forgiveness. O oh, harshness, which is the daughter of egotism. I have to be careful that those words that St. John says do not apply to us. Our, bra our basic presupposition for taking Holy Communion is love for one another. 
It's a good idea prior to Holy Communion from the evening before to seek forgiveness from people in our own family, our friends, our surroundings. The final thing that I'll say about taking communion in a worthy command, uh, manner is we ought to have piety and fear when we're taking Holy Communion. This should exist in us when we are, even when we are approaching communion. All of us, sometimes we can fall victim to approaching Eucharist out of habit and losing this, this reverence, this fear. The, the deacons, when they are singing hymns during Holy Communion, is to keep us occupied in a spiritual manner as we are taking communion so that we are not busy with other things, you know, busy at talking, making plans after liturgy, whatever it is that we may do. We have to have a reverence and an awe. I remember uh, when I became a priest, someone gave me the advice that, you know, you're going to approach the altar every day. And you have to be careful when you're approaching the altar every day that you do not think of it as something routine. That it's a blessing that God give you the privilege to stand in front of him and to offer bread and wine to become the body and blood of Christ. A great privilege and an honor and something that you should do and receive with reverence and awe. And he said to me, because you do it frequently, you may fall into or can be susceptible to the, to, to the trap of, this is normal, it's okay, something I do always. And I think the same thing applies to us when we're taking communion. We do this every Sunday. It's something I'm used to. It's something I always do. So we have to make sure we have this reverence and this awe for Holy Communion so that we understand the value of what we have and the privilege and the honor of what we are receiving. May all of us, may God make us all worthy to partake of his holy body and blood for the remission of our sins. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.